Good morning. It's good to be out. It feels like uh, it's been a while as we uh, weathered the storm of illness. But uh, we thank you for all your prayers and um, thank you for uplifting us. And this morning, I want to, um, I was reading this week, and um, I was reading through a portion of scripture, and I just, as I um, often do at times, just kind of stop, and I'll think, and begin to meditate. I, and I asked the Lord, I, I said, specifically, my question is, what, what were you teaching the disciples? You know, what did you want them to learn? And that's what I want to talk about this, this morning. So I'm going to talk about two things. And one is desire, and the other is obedience. And I want to talk about your desire and your obedience. And, and in turn, what God does. And so we're going to be in the 14th chapter of Matthew bear with me we're, we're going to cut through a lot of scripture here i don't intend to read it um, my assumption is many of you are going to be familiar with these stories and so i want to highlight the stories and some specific things and then i want to get into the message and so uh, in the 14th chapter of matthew we have two really interesting things that happen here back to back and when I was reading, it was after I got through those that I paused and began to, to meditate and, and talk to the Lord. And I want to start in the uh, 13th verse. And to this point, what's happened and what is happening, um, Herod had been kind of tricked into killing John the Baptist. And... He beheaded John the Baptist, and the disciples took the body, buried it, and Jesus decided this is a good time to get out of the city. Things were a little bit too uh, hot there in the city, and so they decided to get out. And in the 13th verse, it says, When Jesus heard of it, being the, the death of John the Baptist and what happened, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. It says, And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And it says, When Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And then it said, When it came, when it was evening, the disciples said, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. The multitude will, you know, send the multitude away, they may go in the villages and feed themselves. And here Jesus tells them, tells the disciples, you know, they don't need to leave. Give me what you have, and let's feed them. And as we know, it says they did eat all, and were, you know, when they took up the fragments, there remained 12 baskets, and there were over 5,000 that were fed. And then it goes immediately into the story. It says, and then straightway Jesus constrains his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him into the other side. And he sent the multitude away. And then it says, when he sent them away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And the evening was come. He was there alone. And the disciples on the ship were now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. It was a difficult trip. And about the fourth watch, so sometime after three o'clock in the morning, it says, Jesus went out to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And then you know, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it, if it be thou, bid me to come. And Peter goes out onto the water. And then at the end, it says, when then, then when Peter and Jesus came back onto the ship, the wind ceased. And as I was reading these this week, I got through that and I just paused and I asked the Lord, I said, what, were you, what were you teaching the disciples here? 
There's a lot, and I'm sure you've heard many messages on these scriptures, each individually. But when I asked the Lord that, He began to, to show me something. How these scriptures are related. And the similarity between them. And so, now that I got through reading it and you have the gist, I'll go back and, and, and touch on the, to certain parts of the scripture that I think are really important. But I want to talk about obedience and desire. And what God does. And when you have those things, where you find yourself in relation to God. Because that's what you see in these two scriptures. First, talk about desire. You have Christ and his disciples fleeing the cities, and it says they went on a ship. They needed to get out. But if you read about the ones that followed him, it says they, on foot, left the cities. Because they heard where Christ was. And they desired to be with him. And so they went up into a desert place. They left whatever they had behind. They didn't take much with them. And it says that Christ was moved with compassion towards them and began to heal them. And it doesn't say how long, but they stayed some measure of time because then when the night came, they were still there, still with Christ, and still without. And I thought, as I was reading this, I thought about these individuals, and I, I thought about the disciples when they were in the garden with Christ before he was taken. And he gave them a simple commandment. He just said, watch and pray. And I thought about these individuals, how they were just there with Christ. That was their desire. That was what they wanted. They wanted to be with Christ. They fled the cities on foot. They went up into a desert where he was. And what did he do? He took the little they had and he fed them. He took the little bit that was there and made it great. My question is, what is our desire? Why are you here this morning? What is your desire? And then, now I want to jump to the disciples. Because these two things are related. So now the disciples, it says that Christ constrained them to get on a ship and go. They didn't do anything wrong. Nothing bad. They got on the ship and they went. And it says that Christ sent the others away. And then once he sent them away, he went up alone to pray. And the disciples found themselves in trouble. And the winds were tossing the boat. And then what happened? Christ came to them. And he showed himself. And I don't want to talk about the miracle of Peter. There was one portion of scripture I skipped over that I want to talk about as well there. But what were the disciples doing? Well, they were obeying the Lord. They were doing what he told them to do. And yet they found themselves in trouble. 
It says that he constrained his disciples to get on a ship and go. They didn't question him and they went. And yet, here they are, the middle of the night, the darkest of the night, and now they're in trouble. And so he comes to them and rescues them. He pulls Peter out of the ship, witnesses a miracle to Peter, but he says something really important, and I'm going to go back to that. But then he comes on the ship with Peter, everything's calm, everything's fine. And I want to talk about these two parables, these two scriptures, these two stories in relation to you this morning, because I'm sure each of you are going to be in one of these camps. Whether you're here this morning because you desire to be with the people of God and you desire a relationship with Christ, or you're appointing your life where you've been obeying the, the, the commandments of God and obeying His will in your life like the disciples and yet each of these individuals, whether the, the people there in the desert who desired to be with Christ or the disciples who were listening to Christ, both found themselves in need, in trouble. The multitude was there without food in the desert, or much food. Disciples were on a ship in the middle of a storm. Neither of them did anything wrong. In fact, both of them were doing right. And yet in both instances, the Lord had to intervene because there was a need. And He did. For those that desired to be with Him, He took the little that they had. Think of that. Have you ever thought, I really don't have much? Have you ever had a great desire to do something? To support? To help? Anything for the Lord? And you thought, I don't really have much. That desire is a good thing, and not having much really isn't all that important to God. He's not concerned about that. Or, you know you've done what the Lord has told you to do. Maybe He has made it plain and clear in your life. Or he's giving you, we'll say, breadcrumbs along the way to lead you. And now you find yourself not where you thought you would be. When Christ called out to Peter, and he, you know, stretched forth his hand, he said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now think about that. Here's Peter on the boat, sees Christ, goes out in the water, and yet Christ identifies in him doubt. Has Peter to this point done anything wrong outside of the will of God? No. He's done everything God has told him to do. He's done everything Christ has directed him to do. And yet here he is doubting. And what is he doubting? Well, he was doubting that he was where he should be.
He was doubting that he was doing the right thing. He was doubting that maybe you're doubting that you're in the will of God. God provides. God was showing, Christ was showing the disciples what they needed to be concerned about and what they needed to do. You can talk a lot more about the doubt that Peter had, but what Christ was concerned about was that he had any. Why? Because he was right where God wanted him to be. Why should he doubt? Well, we do. We find ourselves in situations where we have needs. And that can well up inside of us doubt and fear and concern. You find yourself in the middle of somewhere with nothing. And you have needs. And you found yourself there because... You had a desire to follow Christ. Or you found yourself in the middle of a storm because you were obedient to the voice of the Lord. And doubt begins to enter in. And concern. And that scripture, I love it, the Lord didn't wait for the disciples to call out to Him. He was there. In the middle of the storm. Was right there on the water. Now, do you think they were not in the will of God being there? But we'll question it, won't we? We'll question every trial that we have in life, every difficulty that we have, because we think if we are striving and desire to have that relationship with Christ, if we are desiring and striving to follow after Him, to be obedient to his word, that somehow, some way, nothing bad happens. But that's not what Christ was teaching the disciples. In fact, he was teaching them the exact opposite. That regardless of what we do or think, these things are going to happen. And now, back to back, twice, he showed them what he does. He will intervene. If you have little but desire, he will multiply it. Now think about that for the disciples. Because I, when, I, when I look at the disciples and the apostles, I like to look ahead and see if they learned. Did they understand what Christ was teaching them? Right now, no. But if you skip ahead, you have two men that were here on the boat. And they're walking outside. And they walk through a gate. And the gate's called Beautiful. And there's a man there that asks them a specific question. Can they give him something? Now go back to this moment in the desert. They want to send these men and women away. They don't have food. They're concerned. Lord, we don't, we don't have anything to give them. Send them back into the cities. Let them eat. And the Lord says what? Take what you have and give it to me. And then he provided. So you have these two men that are there in that day on the desert and they have an individual that asks them for something. And what's their answer? We don't have much. Right? Silver and gold have we none. They didn't carry much with them. They didn't have much. But their answer, but such as we have, 
we give to thee. Now, I don't have much, <laughs> but I'll give you something. And he was healed. You think they learned? Lord, we don't have anything, send them away. We don't have enough, Lord, send them away. God will take care of those who desire to be with Him. When you don't have much, when you feel like what you have is so meager, you're, tr you're right. It's true. The disciples did not have much. In the desert, they did not... Five loaves, two fishes. Not enough. But, the Lord showed them, that's fine, that's enough. Give me what you have. And then he took them and he showed them about obedience. He knew that there would be many times where they would doubt. Lord, am I where I should be? Because this situation does not seem okay. Peter, Lord, got this Gentile man. And he wants me to come. And I, I don't think I should. Well, what's the Lord's will? This doesn't seem right, Lord. Gentiles should not be with us. And the Lord showed him. And Peter went. He said, what I've sanctified, don't call unpure. And Peter went. Was there doubt? Absolutely. Lord, this does not seem right. This does not seem okay. I don't know what to do. Are there times that you have doubt in your life? Yes. Does that mean you are in the wrong place? No. The Lord will come to you. He will take care of it. He came to the disciples out on the water right where they could see him. You know, the Christ could have stayed up in the mountain and prayed and the waters could have ceased. But he wanted them to see he was there. And so he got right at eye level with them. Right in the midst of the storm. They're afraid of the waters. I'm going to go out and stand on them. I have kids. Sometimes they're disobedient. So you get right at eye level. So they can see you and hear you. The disciples weren't disobedient. In fact, they were being obedient, but they were concerned. They were worried. And so Christ got right at eye level. Made sure they understood what was going on. They were doing what they were told out on the ship in the middle of the sea. He was there. God 
will take care of those who have a desire to be with him, those who strive to have a relationship with him. He will take care of those who are obedient to his word. The circumstances, the situations don't matter. I promise you, you don't have much to give to the Lord. You don't need to be concerned about what you can provide. The situations that you find yourself in are not because you're outside of the will of God. If he tells you to do something, you do it. If you have a desire to follow him, you follow him. And he will bless you in those things. He will take care of you. There's no reason or need. Sometimes there's a reason we can justify. There's no need to doubt. There's no need to be concerned that he's not going to take what you have and provide for you. Sometimes is. Little and meager as it is. He wanted his disciples to understand that. To see in real time what he does. Why he does it. They wanted to turn those people away for justifiable reasons. We can't feed them. Send them home. Let them eat. No. Let me take care of them. Let me show you what I can do. You're going to follow me? You're going to do what I say? Look what's going to happen. You are going to be out in the middle of the sea. It is going to be difficult. You are going to doubt. I'll be right there. I'll take care of it. You know, it's almost like bidding Peter out on the water. Just see what I can do. Come. Peter understood later. He understood he was to be obedient to the will of God. God said, go to the Gentiles, go to his house. He did. Not concerned or doubting any longer. Disciples knew that God would always provide, take what little they had to offer. And he did. He used them to turn the world upside down. Twelve men with little background in being life-changing individuals began to alter the course of history because they desired to follow after Christ. Because they lived within the will of God. They were obedient to the will of God. That does not mean that we won't have needs that we won't have concerns or doubts or feel inadequate. Or just say, Lord, why am I here? It's in that moment that he'll provide, that he'll give you what you need, sometimes even more than you imagine, that he will get right, right at eye level with you and remind you where he's at and where you're at, right where you should be. Maybe the storm will cease right then. Maybe it'll be later. But he's going to take care of you. So this morning, take solace in that. If you can put yourself in one of these camps or both of these camps, great. Stay there. 
The Lord desires, even as it said, that, that when they came unto him, he had compassion. Because he loved them. And he knew their desire. He knew what they were leaving behind. And he took care of them. May God bless you this morning.
It's one of my favorite songs. I think it, um, it touches on so many of the themes that our, our brother uh, was addressing today. You know, talking about you know, putting your faith in Christ, uh, even struggling with doubt. You know, what is your desire? Um, the, what, a, what a beautiful message. And uh, I wanted to share just one thought with you um, quickly this morning. Because, you know, as, as we prepare for, for Sunday, um, you know, we'll spend time in prayer and reading and, 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 and searching the scriptures and trying to understand what, what God might be giving us. And uh, a lot of times, uh, I don't know about the rest of you brothers, you'll get like a verse, you know, that you keep coming back to a time and time again. And when that verse is something like, seek ye first the kingdom of God or um, God so loved the world, you have a good idea of where you might be going with the message. And... Um, the verse that was kept coming to my mind is the 24th verse in the 25th chapter of Matthew. It says, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not sh strawed. That is a strange verse to keep coming to mind. And um, I, I was thinking about it and praying about it this morning, and, 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 and uh, there was a thought that came to me, and our brother touched on it. He asked the question, he says, um, have you ever thought to yourself, I don't have much, or I don't have much to offer? If you remember, if you're familiar with this 25th chapter of Matthew, um, verses starts in the 14th verse, and it talks about the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who calls his own servants and delivers them goods. And this is the parable of the talents. And he gives one five talents, he gives one two talents, and he gives one one talent. And uh, the one that, th those that were given five and two, they go out and a talent would be like a sum of money. So they, uh, they trade with it. They invest it. They, they're good stewards of the money. So when the, the Lord comes back, they said, we've doubled your money. You gave me five, I now have ten. You gave me two, I now have four. And he goes to the one that had, was given one. And this was his response was, well, I was scared of you. Um, I know that you are a, a hard man, reaping not where you've sown, gathering not where you've strawed. I was afraid and I went my, and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, there uh, thou hast what you've given me. And the Lord answered and said unto them, Thou wicked and slothful servant. So he was trying to make an excuse, said, Well, I did this because I was scared. And the Lord said, No, you didn't. You did this because you were lazy. You did this because you doubted. And, and you read this verse, and it's interesting, because I think I've misinterpreted it before. It's, he, he describes the Lord as someone that reaps where he sows not and gathers where he did not straw. And the thought that came to my mind was, how good is God? That when I make an effort to sow, and I probably don't do it quite right, probably wouldn't do it the way Christ would do it, but when I try... It's so pleasing to the Lord that He will reap the goodness out of that effort. And when I straw, when I, when I gather together what, is, what has been planted and I allow it to dry up, it says that it's so good to the Lord that He will gather it. He will take whatever effort I make and it will be pleasing to Him. And it doesn't matter if it's one talent and it doesn't matter if it's two talents and it doesn't matter if it's five talents. And uh, as our brother touched on, you know, this, this miraculous situation where they didn't have much. A couple loaves and some fishes. But the Lord said, if you give that to me, if you put that to work, if you take that small thing that you think this in no way could have any impact on this multitude, let me show you what I can do. Because that was the mindset of this individual is, I can't do anything with this one talent. I'm, I'm, I'm too scared. You know, there's, you know, if I had five, maybe I could do something with it. If I had two, maybe I could do something with it. But the Lord said, no, the expectation was, I gave you something. And we've all been given something. You know, whether you're, you're asked to, to travel the world preaching the gospel, or if you're being called to serve just in your home, and it's difficult to leave your home because of the challenges that are there. God has given you something. And he will bless that. And he will multiply that. 
because he loves us so very much. And there's, there's so many examples in scriptures where, where he does that time and time again of he takes small means and does great things. And it's okay if we make mistakes. And it's okay if we don't do things quite right. But it's that effort, that desire our brother talked about. I have a desire to serve the Lord and I'm going to be obedient to the best of my ability. And God will multiply that in amazing, amazing ways. So I, I, next time you read that verse, you come across that and it's, you know, you are a hard man reaping not where you sow. Think to yourself, no, God is a, a, a wonderful Lord. And no matter how crazy my sowing, how crazy my planting, my farming, whatever it is, he's going to find good enough in it that he's going to reap it and he's going to gather it into his house. All right, we're going to bring our uh, morning service to a close. Uh, but we're going to come back after lunch. So um, hopefully you brought a lunch. And if not, uh, I think we can share. Uh, but we're going to break and we're going to come upstairs about 1245. And we'll get singing and started with uh, communion. Um, I do have a couple of announcements that I